Father, this morning, we want to praise you for your love. A love that never fails us, a love that never gives up. In fact, it's a love that pursues us throughout a lifetime. A love that's demonstrated in Jesus Christ who gave himself for our sins so that we could become sons and daughters of God through faith in him. And Father, this morning, we we pray that you would meet us here, that you would communicate your love through the power of your Holy Spirit, that he would speak truth into our lives from your word, and we would be changed because we have been in the presence of God Almighty, who loves us with a love that never lets us go. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I'm going to invite you to take your Bibles or your Bible apps and turn to Matthew chapter 2. If, um, if you don't have a Bible with you or a Bible app on your device, then grab one of the Bibles in the pews around here. Uh, we want you to have the Word of God, be able to use the Word of God, and uh, it's page 1026 if you want to take the easy route. By the way, if you don't own a Bible and you need one, take one of these with you when you leave. We really want you to, to possess the Word of God and allow it to speak into your life all the time. And speaking of that, um, uh, while I'm on the subject of the Bible, I want to encourage you to consider a a challenge that the pastors are taking on themselves. We're going to read through the Bible in 90 days uh, from January through March. And uh, and some of you are going, read the Bible in 90 days? Seriously? And yeah, we're serious about this. Now, we realize that some of you read through the Bible every year. You've got that read through the Bible year plan, and you just kind of day after day after day. And that works for some of you. Some of you are wired that way. And others are a little more ADD. And uh, because what happens to me is I'm going to read through the Bible in a year and somewhere around April I forget, you know, and and uh, so I've read like the first third, you know, solid through, you know, like a ton of times. But um, uh, here's what we're going to do. Some of of us need like a challenge and we need it to be a sprint rather than a marathon. And so we're going to do that from January through March. And if you want to do it with us, there are reading guides available at the Connection Center. You can stop by and pick one of those up. It's not an easy challenge. It means that for 90 days you got to put reading the Bible at the top of the the priority list because it's going to take you at least a half an hour a day to to devour that much Scripture. And and, uh, it's not a Bible study. We're just talking about immersing yourself in the Word of God and reading it cover to cover in 90 days. So if you're up for that, then uh, take hold of that, grab one of those. And uh, if you're really smart, you'll grab one of the reading guides and you'll get ahead and cheat a little bit and read ahead. (laughs) Not sure that's bad uh, to to read ahead in the Word of God. Hey, uh, We're continuing our series, Journey of Christmas, and we're looking at the Christmas account in Matthew. Uh, Again, I shared last week the the story of Jesus' birth is contained in two of the Gospels, Matthew and Luke, and and we're looking at the Matthew account, and and today we're looking at an account where you know the story, but you may not know all the details, and, uh, and we hope you find some because we're talking about discovery today, Christmas being a journey of discovery. And discovery can be exciting or unsettling. You know, actually, discovery can be lots of things. Discovery can be irritating, right? Isn't it annoying when you pour the, the cereal in the bowl and then you go to the fridge and there's no milk? It, it, doesn't that just kind of like, ah, that's a, that's a terrible discovery. Or the discovery where, where you, uh, uh, you know, you, you, the batteries die on the remote control. And most of us in here actually grew up in a time when there weren't remote controls for everything. And we actually got up and changed the channel. Remember that? But, but when those batteries die on the remote control, doesn't that just irritate you to know? Because you never have those batteries around. Right? Or, or what's, what's even worse than that, and, and I'm pretty sure it's a design flaw, is the batteries in a smoke detector. Because has anyone ever had a, a smoke detector start chirping to them in daylight? I mean, it's always between midnight and 4 a.m. It's like whoever built those things, I've got this really evil little secret. No, I mean, it's just irritating. And you discover that, and you're like, I can't sleep through it. i got to go get the ladder and fix it now, and there goes your night's sleep. So discovery can be irritating. Discovery can be awkward. You know, like, have you ever, like, you said, hey, let's, let's uh, have a little party and invite some people over, and, and you discover, like, the day of the party that they can't come? You know, stuff happens in all their lives, and suddenly you have a party and nobody shows up. That's awkward, isn't it? What's even more awkward is having one person show up. And you're just staring at them like, yeah, you're the only loser that didn't have anything else to do tonight. 
Can he just go home so I can cry in peace about not having any friends? Uh, it's awkward. Discovery can be embarrassing. Like, you know, standing in front of a group of people and discovering your zipper's down. Yeah, that's our fear. I'm just telling you right now, all the pastors, we all check, you know, you know, just kind of, that's it, it's good, it's good. You don't, you don't see us doing that because we're doing it on the front row, okay? Our backs are to you, but I'm just confessing right now. And, and sometimes we check twice because you're like, was it, was it really down? And uh, are you ladies? I'm, I'm sure none of you have ever done this, but, uh, you know, tucked your dress into your hose, walked out of the bathroom and had your friends tackle you. You know, because if they're not your friends, they'll let you walk, you know. That's a, that's a bad discovery right there. It's a little bit embarrassing. Or, you know, I'm sure that, again, that hasn't happened to anyone else other than me, but you, you discover you walk into the wrong restroom, you know. Walk in there like, oh, wait, you're the wrong gender. I got to go. So, uh, yeah, this, that, they, those are just embarrassing discoveries. And sometimes discovery can be unsettling. Like when the doctor says, we're going to order some more tests because we don't know why. Uh, or you discover that you were downsized, and you got to look for a job. And of course, discoveries can be tragic. You know, when they come back and say, after the test, it is cancer. Uh, or when you get that call in the night, and a loved one has passed away. Those, those are discoveries that are tragic. And, and then, of course, there's discoveries that are exciting. Like when you encounter that young couple that's getting married, and they're just all bubbling over, and, and, and you know, a lot of you are like, yeah, just wait. <laughs> but they're excited or when you discover that you know you're you get a promotion at the you know or, or a bonus or you know those are exciting discoveries or when you discover you're going to have a child or a grandchild and you're like wow this is so cool so Christmas is a journey of discovery so let's look at Matthew chapter 2 beginning at verse 1 and discover some things uh, about Christmas and, and, and again, this is a very familiar story, and, and a lot of you have grown up hearing this story. I want you to see the details of what Scripture actually says about the visit of the wise men. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. They told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet, And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel." Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child, and when you have found him, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. And after listening to the king, they went on their way, and behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. Then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. Now, the very first discovery that I want to I mention, and this may be unsettling for some of you, uh, did you notice verse 11? It said, and going into the house. Going into the house is where they found Mary and Jesus. Uh, so here's the unsettling news. You know that whole nativity scene you have set up in your house? The one that's on your coffee table or on your end table where the people come in the house and everything? Um, just for the record, biblically speaking, the wise men weren't there. Okay, I know it's a romantic picture and Hollywood does it really well. I love the movie The Nativity Story. It's beautiful how it ends. It just isn't biblical. The wise men weren't at the manger. They weren't there with the shepherds and on that night Jesus was born. Uh, they didn't show up until later. So, you know, uh, now I'm not saying that you should go home and to your nativity set and crush the wise men. <laughs> okay, don't throw them away like you guys, you frauds, you weren't there. 
Not suggesting that, but if you want to teach your kids something, put the, put the you know, nativity scene out and you know, hide the wise men for the first couple of weeks. Let them come visit later, you know? <laughs> then you can explain to your kids why they showed up you know, late December or March. Uh, and... Uh, when you put it out there for a while, because it's a, it's a way to teach your kids. So just, it's okay to put them all out there and make it all look good. Just you and I need to know what the Bible actually says, uh, because we need to know the truth, okay? Uh, now, the real point of discovery in this is that the Magi found Jesus because they were searching for him. The wise men found Jesus because they were searching for him. Uh, you know, they, they saw the star. These guys were astronomers, uh, actually astrologers, living someplace probably around modern-day Iran. And, and they were reading the stars, and God communicated to them that something special was happening in Israel. And so they packed up, and, and they traveled hundreds of miles to, to get there. And when they got there, they got to Jerusalem, and, and they said, hey, we're here to worship the one who's born king of the Jews, and everybody was shocked. And dismayed, and Herod was upset because he saw it as a potential rival, and he said, you know, we, we got to figure this out. So where's the one who's supposed to be born king of the Jews? And the chief priests and the scribes and the teachers of the law, they all knew, it's, well, it's Bethlehem. It's a no-brainer. Everybody knows Bethlehem. And so then the, the wise men went on their way. They went to Bethlehem, and, and they had this long journey to find Jesus. It wasn't an easy journey. It was, it was difficult, and it wasn't a short journey. It was, it was long. Now, what's interesting is that the people who were informed about Messiah weren't looking for him. Even after the Magi showed up, the chief priests and the scribes and all those people, they weren't looking for him. Now, don't you think, just for a moment, that, that here they are, these guys, these foreigners show up in Jerusalem going, hey, we're here to worship the one born king of the Jews. We saw a star, and, and we want to worship him. We want to pay homage to him. We want to acknowledge him. And, and uh, all these religious people who are supposed to know all this stuff about the Messiah, well, it's Bethlehem, and that's it. Does it not bother anybody else that there was not an entourage of people going with the wise men to Bethlehem? I mean, doesn't that just kind of blow your mind? I mean, for 400 years, the Jews had not had any message from God. I mean, they, their last prophet was 400 years before Christ was born. So for 400 years, they've been desperately waiting for God to speak to them, to communicate in some way. And these foreigners show up and say, hey, the king of the Jews is born, and nobody goes with them. I mean, what are they thinking? The wise men found Jesus because they were searching for him. The religious people weren't. Now think about that. Why are you here today? Why are you here today? Are you, are you here looking for Jesus? Or are you just here because you're supposed to be here? Because have you ever noticed that we usually find what we're looking for? We usually find what we're looking for with a big exception of men and pantries. <laughs> because that's like one place that we're not going to find anything that we're looking for. Right, guys? Not unless we put it in there and it's important to us, but we, it all disappears. But other than that, we find what we're looking for. We're going to discover it. If you're looking to take responsibility, people will gladly give you responsibility. But if you're looking to find excuses, you will find a world of excuses. If you're looking to find the good in people to recognize or celebrate, you can find it in most people really easily. If you are looking to find flaws that you can criticize, you will find them in every person that walks this earth. But if you are truly searching for Jesus, if you want to find life seeking God, then you're going to find him. You're going to find Jesus if you're looking for him because that's the promise of God. Jeremiah 29, verse 11 through 13. God says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord's. Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me and I will hear you and you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. Jesus echoes that in Matthew 7, 7 when he says, Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. We usually find what we're looking for. So what are you seeking today. What are you seeking today? 
Because you can show up in church every week and completely and totally miss Jesus. You can be religious and never really look for Jesus. Are you looking for healing? Are you looking for prosperity? Are you looking for success? Are you looking for victory? You know what? I can't promise you those things. But if you are seeking a savior, if you're seeking forgiveness, if you are seeking life, if you're seeking joy, if you want to find God, then you will find Jesus and he will change your life. The Magi found Jesus because they were looking for him. What are you searching for today? See, I really want you to take this question with you out from here because this is a one you got to look in your heart. You, you got to do some reflection. You need to really figure out because there's a lot of people in this world who are searching for the wrong thing. And when they find it, it doesn't satisfy. And they realize too late that they've run the race in vain. What are you searching for? If a relationship with Jesus Christ isn't at the top of the list and you're missing the point, are you searching for Jesus because that way you'll find him? The other thing I want you to, to see in this passage is that discovering Jesus leads us to worship. Discovering Jesus leads us to worship. The purpose of the trip for the Magi was worship. Do you see that in verse 2? Where is he who's been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose, and we have come to worship him. And then when they found Jesus, what did they do? Verse 11. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. Then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. Worship is the natural response to discovering that worship is the natural response to discovering Jesus. That means that if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, if you believe that Jesus is the Son of God, the Savior of the world, you believe that Jesus died on the cross to pay for your sins, personally, your sins, you believe that Jesus was raised from the dead, and you have made a commitment to follow Jesus with your life, then that means that you're going to be drawn to worship Jesus. You're going to be drawn to worship him. Just like the Magi, when they encountered this king of the Jews, they bowed down and they worshipped him. They, they, they gave him honor. And, and I, I want to submit to you that it is our responsibility, but it's also our response to Jesus to worship him. Now, that said, understand that there's a, a lot of stuff going on in our culture, in our world today, that calls us to go the other way. And I'm going to talk about this just for a minute. There, there's a group in this world that doesn't believe in Jesus. It's a big group. Doesn't believe in Jesus at all. And they really, in our culture, in our time right now in America, they want to marginalize Jesus. They want to make Jesus unimportant, right? These are the people that want to take, you know, Christ out of Christmas. They're the ones who want to, you know, uh, replace Merry Christmas with season's greetings, happy holidays, all that kind of stuff. They, they want to marginalize Christ because they don't believe in him. Right? They, they, don't, they don't think he's the savior. They, they think that he messes things up. And so they really are winning the, the debate in the public square. And they're marginalizing Jesus. Those of us who believe in Jesus, who follow Jesus, we don't want him marginalized. We want him magnified. We want to lift him up. We want to exalt him. That's what worship means. We want to exalt, worship our savior. And so right now in our day, in America today, we, we've got this clash going on. You guys are aware of this, right? And, and, and it's all out there. You, you read about it. You hear about it. There's, there's all kinds of responses going on to this. And, and I want to rant about this just for a minute. So follow along with me and, and see if this doesn't make sense. So you've got a group that's out here that really uh, that owns the airwaves that, that is marginalizing Jesus. And then there's those of us who want to magnify Jesus. And, and there's this cultural clash that's going on uh, in America today right now between those who want to magnify Jesus and those who want to marginalize Jesus. And it comes to a peak right now when they're removing nativity scenes from public squares and telling them to take down crosses and, and stores or season's greetings. And, and, and it looks like on one hand that the marginalizers are winning. And, and let's just be honest, that irritates us, doesn't it? Okay, anybody else get irritated besides me? I read stuff. I, okay, lots of hands go. Okay, we're, we're all in this together. This is gonna, hopefully this is going to make sense now. 
And, and in our hearts, we have this desire to protect our tradition. Because at one point, you know, we know this country was founded on Jesus principles. And, and for a long time, the Jesus principles carried the day. Even if people didn't believe them, they adhered to them. And that's not this day. And so we kind of get irritated, and sometimes we kind of respond, well, here's what wells up inside of me. You know, when somebody, you know, wants to say, you know, happy holidays instead of Merry Christmas, I just want to, you know, revert to childhood and tackle them. <laughs> Sit on their chest and drool on their face until they say Merry Christmas, right? Anybody else with me? And, uh, hey, you can laugh, but just wait. And so um, I, I even heard that there's like, there's like, Christian songs that are out there making the rounds on email and, and stuff that are that are like singing songs, little Christmas songs about boycotting retailers and stuff like that. There's there's this reaction that the, the people who want to magnify Jesus are like, hey, you can't take our Jesus away from us. And here's the truth, they can't. They really can't. And, and here's the other thing. If we turn into people that when somebody says happy holidays, we get in their face. We go, well, it's not happy holidays. It's Merry Christmas because if you take Jesus out of Christmas, it's not Christmas at all. We're not really magnifying Jesus at that point. Thanks, Lord. Praying that through, right? And, and uh, we're, we're not magnifying Jesus. We're just being a jerk. Because it doesn't exalt Jesus if we yell at people for not believing in Jesus. See, understand, the people who are marginalizing Jesus are the ones that we need to share Jesus with. They're the ones who are our target audience of, of leading people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ through the love of his people and the power of his truth. But if you're yelling at people, if you're boycotting their stores, if you're making a big deal about it, guess what? You're not going to be leading them toward Jesus. You're not going to be magnifying Jesus because you... Honestly, when we get all rude and angry in the public square over people taking shots at Jesus and we act out like the jerks that I just described, we're being anti-Christ. Because that's not what Jesus would say or do. In fact, you know what Jesus said? Jesus said, hey, to his followers, he said, hey, don't be surprised when people hate you. Because of me? Because they hated me first. Oh, so this whole marginalizing Jesus thing, he, he's like, they're going to do it. They've been doing it for 2,000 years. Why do you think they're going to stop now? And, and so we don't need to get angry. You know what we need to do? We need to smile and say Merry Christmas and, and, and be kind and compassionate toward them because they need to know our Savior, and, and they're not going to know him if we yell at them and keep boycotting. Now, I hope that makes sense to you because when we discover the life-changing power of Jesus Christ and he leads us to worship him, it, it draws us to worship him. And worship means that we're going to magnify Jesus. And so everything that we say and do needs to magnify Jesus. It, needs, it means that we've got to represent Jesus. So what, is it, what does worship do? What do the Magi do? They bow down. They submitted themselves to the authority of the king of the Jews. And they, and they exalted him. They praised him. They, they talked about, we're here to worship the king. And, and then they gave gifts to him. They said, we, you're, you're worthy of these, these precious gifts that we want to give. And, and they rejoiced because they found him. So if we're going to be drawn to worship, if discovering Jesus and the reality of his life-changing power is, is in our lives, we're going to be drawn to do those things, aren't we? which means that we're going to be drawn to submit to Jesus Christ. Submit to his authority because he's the king of kings. By the way, submitting to Jesus doesn't mean that we just physically bow down. It means that we believe what he says and we obey it. That's why we want you to read the Bible. Because it tells us how to live for Christ. It tells us what to believe. And, and, and so we want to take this book and we want to put it into our lives and we want to learn it and we want to obey it because that's worship submitting to his authority. It, it means that we praise him. Why do you think we have the band up here leading us to sing? Because we want to praise Jesus with our mouth, but we don't just praise him with our mouth, we praise him with our actions. That the things we do, the way that we act in the community communicates his love, his grace, his truth to people. See, worship isn't just coming and sitting here for an hour a week. It's what we do when we're outside 
to honor Christ is what it means. It means that we rejoice. Wise men rejoiced when they found Jesus. And, and it means that, that we celebrate. You know, some of you are going, why do you guys dress like dorks today? Christmas dorks, by the way. Um, and, and, uh, and the answer is because we can and we want to have fun because we have life in Jesus Christ. And, and it's life that nothing in this world can take away. And it's life that's going to last forever and ever. Amen. And, and so we have reason to rejoice because Jesus has given us that life. And it means that we give gifts. That we take our valuables and we say, Jesus, we want to give these to you to honor you. That, that's what you did in, in putting together those shoe boxes. And I don't know how much fun you had putting together those shoe boxes, but those are gifts that you gave to Jesus. That, that we got to put in the hands of the least of these little children. That's honoring to him. But what other gifts, what other valuables do you have that you want to give to Jesus? And I, I don't mean to me or, or to the church, but I mean to Jesus. Yeah, sometimes we got to handle that for him, but your gifts are to him. And a lot of times we forget that and, and we waste more on ourselves than we give to our Savior. See, that's part of worship. It's not just showing up, but actively responding to the Savior who has set us free. So today, I pray that you have made some discoveries. Discoveries about Christmas and the Christmas story. Discoveries about yourself and discoveries about Jesus Christ and how he can change your life. And my real prayer is that you have found a life-changing relationship with Jesus and that today and forever you will choose to worship him in every way say thank you again that you have loved us with an undying love that you have sacrificed for us so that we could be sons and daughters of God by faith that you promised to never leave us or forsake us and Lord today we want to worship you not just with our words but with our lives we want to give ourselves as living sacrifices holy and acceptable unto you which is our reasonable service of worship and so today, God, speak to our hearts. Change the way we think. Change the way that we live as we give ourselves to you once again. Thank you that even when we fail, your grace, your mercy, your love, and forgiveness is always there waiting. We praise you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's stand and worship our God.